Dr. Del C. Allison Jr., last of all, the epistles of Paul, the letters of Paul, are these loaded with legend or are they history? How do you understand the letters of Paul? I'll throw a few things at you, but before we do, I hope people will sign up for our course. It helps support what you're doing. It helps support what we're doing in getting this education out there to a larger audience. You are a Princeton professor. So I hope people will actually go and sign up and check out what you do in this course, the quest for the historical Jesus and understand how we got to where we are today in New Testament studies. Last one, and this is where we're peeling back the layers to try and get close. I asked Paula Fredrickson, Dr. Fredrickson, is there anything that you would say, what's a good way of trying to figure out about the historical Jesus, right? Since your course is on the quest for the historical Jesus, she says, well, I would draw a line backwards from the gospels down into Paul and try to anchor it that way the best you can. She said, if there's one thing, if I were to put a high amount of certainty or confidence in, it's that Jesus was crucified. Other than that, she said, <laughs> I just wouldn't put any overwhelming you know, confidence in. I could say, I think this, or I think that, and you're so well. I actually value that about you. So please don't take any way that you're letting me down. If anything, this is how I think. I'm with you on this, on knowing what did or didn't happen. You and me both can play the sandbox game. We get in the sandbox. We can hypothetically say, well, if that happened, then this could be the case. And that, and I like that. So, Paul, I just recently read Richard C. Miller's book, Resurrection and Reception in Early Christianity. Have you read that book yet? Where was it published? I, ooh, where, you said? No, no, when? So, I look, I probably have, but I've read so much I can't recall things by now. I, I may have a footnote on that somewhere, uh, but I may not. Yeah. I can't keep track of, of, of names anymore. I'm, I'm sorry. I, have I believe to it's a Rutledge publication, and um, he published this. Looking at it right now. Bear with me. I apologize. Um, Rutledge, 2015. And I, I probably looked at it then. But yeah, I, can't, you know. I can give you the gist of his, his argument. Um, well, he tells you Justin's confession. I'll give you the breakdown. Evil demons, Zeus's other sons, proper inference, translation fables, and Hellenistic and Roman antiquity. In that entire chapter, he literally lists hundreds of missing bodies from figures oh. in the Greco-Roman world mm -hmm. who, it, whether they disappear into a river, into uh, Zeus's lightning bolt, in a battle, whatever it might be, and there are hundreds of them, he lists, that make the missing body idea something that is relevant in the in that world critical method in the gospels of course he really spends a lot of time about language and how it's anchored into the into the it's like today if i said some things i wrote a book you would pretty much you could probably dissect it if you're forensic enough and know that i'm writing around 2022 2023 due to whatever inference the language is anchored into the time in which it's being written he wants to do that because he wants to show how it connects to the greek and roman world uh and and then he goes into translation fables in the gospels in the last chapter critical method in the gospels then translation fables in the gospels and he wants to tie it in i say all that to say he points, whether you agree with his position that Justin Martyr, Origen, and others who compare Jesus in some ways in their apologies uh, to the Z sons of Zeus and saying, hey, look, you have eyewitnesses about Caesars that are having apotheosis. Like you have all these things. We're the ones that are hated, though. And it sucks that that's how it was. But um, he's kind of trying to 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 analogize at least what they're believing about Jesus and how it's similar. Like the ascension of Jesus in Acts, it looks like the kind of like what Romulus has. He literally is in a cloud. Have you done any comparison about that? Yeah, I don't think, um, I don't think that's history. And I do think that that's a place where Greco-Roman parallels are probably, I'll probably offer the best uh, explanation. Um, you know, I don't know. You know, I hate I hate to say this because I do look at books. I even sometimes write about books. And given my memory these days, I just go on and then then I can't recall what I did. Uh, but when I discuss the empty tomb, I do list uh, and refer to lots of stories about missing bodies. Uh, 
of uh, certain figures in the Greco-Roman or even ancient Near Eastern world and even later Christianity. And my conclusion is that this is the strongest argument against uh, a historical empty tomb. And it is something that should trouble the apologist. And it's one of the, the reasons that I'm not sure of uh, my own tentative conclusion on this. I, I argue in the book, I think the tomb was more likely than not empty. And then I give lots of reasons. But I also say that this is a very good argument on the other side. If I can go back to Paul and just make one comment then, or one yeah. assessment and then get your thoughts. I, I've always read when I read Paul, I think this is bedrock, meaning this happened. And it was t it was until recently that Richard Miller brought it to my attention when he said, Derek, he's kind of like he thinks more in poetic meta narrative. There's meaning in stories and in, in tropes and things like that more than if it happened, it, then it means something. If it didn't happen, it doesn't. And so the point is, I started to reread 1 Corinthians 15. Even the, he appeared to so-and-so and he appeared to me. And I'm not ruling out historical kernel, okay, memory. I'm saying, I'm wondering if this creed itself has come, has taken upon legend itself in some way. Because when we do look at other stories, I can't, you, you, there's no way to prove it or not prove it. But when I look at other narratives about Romulus having eyewitness testimony of Proculus Julius or whatever, and then I also know that there are narratives with Caesars having the apotheosis three days, four days after they die. And they sometimes would even hire someone, it sounds like, or maybe they paid them after the fact about coming forward. So it's like, hey, good boy, here's 250 denarii, like 250,000 <laughs> denarii. But like, I'm not saying that that's what's going on with, the early Christians. I'm simply saying it seems like if you're going to have a deification apotheosis narrative, as we see in 1 Corinthians 15, having eyewitnesses is an important facet to that story. If I use the word story or your narrative that you're trying to convey. But, 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 but that's, that's, that's part of apologetics for every controversial historical event. So that's not confined to that. This is just human nature. And when you have something controversial or something important, wherever you are in our time and place, for example, you want to get to, 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 uh, to eyewitnesses. So I, I don't see that as special to, to that event. But going back to the story thing, I'm not, I'm not sure what that was about. I must have misheard because I always thought that at least the Paul of the letters can't, doesn't he doesn't tell stories he, he doesn't tell stories at all and i've never thought of first corinthians 15 as a as a story i've often i'm looking at it as like he's giving the gospel message the narrative of the narrative i mean and when i say story is here is uh <clears throat> jesus's gospel right he died he he it's it's the topos uh of of how one is in Christ, how one is to, what is going to come, um, the cosmic transformation of all things that are, it's very theological. So I wondered, I'm not reading it like I would say a gospel narrative necessarily, but I'm wondering if this formula here that he mentioned since first Corinthians is kind of fitting into, here's a polished trope about our early movement and it's reliable. You should trust this. Jesus rose and he's giving that rather than reading it in the literal this is exactly what happened kind of way well he's not <laughs> okay but he's not know, giving it out any there. Detail. he's just not giving any details uh, first of all again i may be misunderstanding something here but paul paul ju doesn't just say that he uh is passing this on he says he receives it so it sounds like this is tradition and most people have thought that that the pieces of this must be uh, traditional, and that Paul is not composing this. So I've never actually thought of this as Paul's. I've thought that Paul may be adding at the end, you know, the uh, the appearance to uh, all the apostles, and then, then his own thing, or maybe he's inserting the the five hundred. But I think that the the main clauses here are some kind of formula, and of course, uh, of course, you want. Uh, if you're a new religious movement and you're making controversial claims, of course you want to have something like uh, eyewitnesses, but you do for 
for for everything. Gospel of John wants this. Luke one wants uh, wants that. Um, it's just what you do, isn't it? So I I totally agree. I I to give an example, when you mentioned, "For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you, uh-huh. the Lord Jesus, on the night He was betrayed." This is First Corinthians eleven, First Corinthians fifteen. For what I received, I passed on to you. I tend to think that this could be earlier traditions from Christians that gave it to Paul, especially when he lists them and he says, you know, he appeared first to so-and-so and last yeah. to all me kind of stuff. But when, when I read this and I had Robin Faith Walsh recently on first uh, Corinthians 11, for I received from the Lord, what I also passed on to you, on to you, the Lord Jesus. So she says that this narrative about the last supper, nowhere in Paul implies that he got this from someone else other than Jesus. And this is the resurrected Lord that's talking to him. So he, he's saying, mm-hmm. like, I received this from the Lord that on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And and I think Bart Ehrman did a good article saying this is God betraying him, not Judas necessarily. So there might be some literary reasons or some reasons to make Judas the guy. But either way, God's actively involved in, in the crucifixion, according to the narratives of the Gospels. So uh, I'm reading this and I'm going, he received this from the Lord. He doesn't say he got this from the earlier disciples. I'm wondering if 1 Corinthians 15 could be something similar. I, I, there's no way to know. So, any- so, so, so first of all, I, I, do, I, I know the hypothesis you're talking about. It's also been argued for by Francis Watson. And if you go back far enough, you can pe- find people in the 19th century arguing this and probably probably before that. But what it does require is it does require that the texts in Matthew, Mark, and Luke have to be ultimately dependent upon Paul. And uh, I, I don't buy that. I don't buy that that the one place we have a detailed speech of Jesus is the one place where the, the gospel writers are dependent on Paul because they're not dependent on Paul for, for most of the material. Mm-hmm. If, if Paul received this and as a personal revelation, then it makes uh, everybody dependent upon Paul. But it looks to me like uh, Matthew is not a text that depends upon uh, Paul, for example. Could- could they could Mark be dependent on Paul and Matthew and Luke are using that through through so, Mark they're getting Paul? No, I don't. So I I actually think that Paul uh, is an influence on Mark, but I don't think he's the source of these words. I don't think this is how Mark is using uh, Paul. The same thing same thing with Luke. But with regard to First Corinthians fifteen, that wouldn't make any sense to me just because. Um, he refers to the appearances to James and the appearances to um, Peter. And he knows these two people personally. It would be really weird, I think, to think that he got this information about them, never talked to them about it or or, or whatever. It just, he knows these people. Uh, He's, he's talked to them. He's fought with them and with, you know, their followers so mm-hmm. I don't see any reason to posit uh, such a thing. If he knows the people he's talking about, then the information is either from them or at least consistent with his conversations with them. There's no way that this is a heavenly revelation. Does it make any sense uh, to me? Thank you. Yeah. I, so I don't think it's heavenly. I just wanted to get your thoughts on this. And I'm with you. I don't think it needs to be, oh, it's all concocted or created. I think there's there's possibly in some way a, a blend of stuff that could be occurring here. And I definitely think that there were early Christians who actually believed that they saw the risen Lord uh, in their minds. I mean, whether you think that's literally the case or you think there are alternative explanations that best suit the data, either way, um, I just figure it fits a common theme. As you said, it's ubiquitous, right? We all want eyewitnesses to something. Yeah. At least it'll help us. So maybe that isn't necessarily part of a trope. Um, I kind of wondered with him having the, um, he's buried and then he, of course, apotheosis in Paul. Um, this, this is something that does fit within that uh, Greek Roman world. And Paul seems to be using rhetoric oftentimes from this. So 
I don't know where I've not studied in depth. I'm not a scholar like you. I wish I learned the Greek and maybe one day I will and dive deep into this to kind of wonder what is Paul doing even here? Because notice we went backwards. We went from like highly theological, legendary John to getting to closer to what we would say to the earliest Jesus movement. And then we go to Paul and they're building on Paul uh, using him somehow, I would say, at least Mark is. Um, but I'm wondering if what we can say about this creed. Have you heard any scholars out there that try to say that even the creed's legendary or something? Uh, well, yeah, I've known. Um, <laughs> yes, I've known. I know the thesis that this is a, an interpolation, that this is not Paul, that this is secondary after after Paul. But to my knowledge, there's only one one living person who thinks that. And um, I I read his article on this. I, I wasn't persuaded by this. Um, you know, gosh, there's so much to be said here. So again, Paul is like uh, Luke. Paul has uh, a Greek education because he's writing in Greek, right? So he has to know a lot of the literature and he lives in the diaspora and it, the Greek world it, it is everywhere. But, you know, this Ophthe formula plus a dative, you know, he appeared to, to Cephas and then so on. Um, I'm sure you can find parallels to that in, in the Greek world, but this is also a, a formula of, of Theophanes in the in the, the Septuagint, that is when the Lord appears to, mm -hmm. you know, Chorios appears to so-and-so, appeared to Abraham, appeared to David, and this is the, that formula also. And again, while you don't want, you can't draw these walls of distinctions, right. but given that when Paul, even though you can find Paul uh, alluding to, uh, let's say, a, a Greek author now and then, or he's using a Greek trope, it's still the case that he's quoting from the Septuagint right. on the page, right? So that's his primary text or primary influence. And so... If I see parallels with that, that's going to be my first thought. And then the other parallels are going to be secondary to that. Because the one thing uh, I know for certain, I know he's living in this text. He might even have copies of these things. I don't know. Uh, Ed Sanders thought he had these things memorized, that he was, in fact, some kind of rabbi. And he just had these texts memorized in his head. Hmm. Uh, how, how much of Greek tradition he would have memorized like that, I have no idea. But he says he was a Pharisee, and Pharisees sat around and uh, I'm pretty sure memorized large, large bodies of, of literature. And it would have been biblical literature, first of all. I'm with you. Thank you. And I think if we're going to do this, you're right. I think the lesson is be be fair in recognizing both worlds play a role because it's not like an either or. However, I would say it's a little more heavy handed on biblical literature being that is the tradition they're working within. Um, so Hellenism penetrated everything. Even the, the people in Qumran had like extremely Hellenistic uh, views and yet they were obviously biblicist. Dr. Allison, real quick. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to add one thing, and I'm never going to do it. I started it once and got a little ways. But, you know, we're always wondering about the meaning of these parallels, right? And I've always thought it would be really helpful if somebody would go through a body of literature that can't possibly have any connection to, let's say, early Christian literature and hunt for all the parables, parallels. I would love to see somebody go through early Confucian literature and all the sayings attributed to Confucius and all the stories about Confucius. And I would like for somebody to show us all of the parallels. And I'll bet many of them would be astounding. And we'd say, oh, wow. And if these parallels existed, let's say, in the Greco-Roman world, we'd say, oh, my goodness, look at that. The same thing with early Buddhist traditions. I would love for somebody to look at Buddhist texts from a certain time and place where we know there's no interaction with uh, Western religious texts, and then look at all the parallels. I'll bet we could find them. And when we do that sort of experiment, then uh, it, it would make us a little more cautious or raise questions, or we'd have to be more sophisticated about uh, method. Several times I've actually... Um, 
del- I do this a couple of times in the book on resurrection. Mm-hmm. I have deliberately said, okay, somebody's come up uh, with a list of, let's say, parallels between the burial of uh, Jesus by Joseph of Arimathea and some passage in Judges, right? And, and look at them. And I say, well, okay, I'm going to come up with parallels between this and, and uh, I, in that book, I remember, hey, Joseph, uh, you know, buries somebody at the end of Genesis, and I'll see what I can come up with. And I came up with fantastic parallels, mm-hmm. and I just made it up. Um, I, uh, I, and I've done this several times. I've just said, okay, somebody's looking at these, th- these parallels between this and this. So I'm going to take this and I'm just going to draw out of a hat some passage in numbers or whatever it is. And I'm going to show all the parallels and I've done it. And it really does make you think uh, second thoughts about what we're doing with parallels. And this is in part why I'm so cautious here, because when I do read Paul or let's say Matthew, especially Matthew, I do know that these people are constantly thinking in biblical texts, right? So that's always going to be my first go-to. It doesn't mean that's all they went to, and it doesn't mean I should stop my attention there, but it's always going to be the first thing that I'm, I'm going to think about because you you know, you know, can do anything with statistics and you can do anything with parallels. It's, it's, it's the same game. I'm with you. And I think if you're going to do it, there is parallel, parallel mania. I also yeah. coined this with Dennis McDonald and others. There's parallel phobia. And I think if we're going to do the exercise, we shouldn't like we do historical research. You we're probabilistic. Right. And if you have good methodology, you could say, hey, this could be the case. Mm-hmm. Um, but just don't don't go out there in any dogmatic way, assuming this is a parallel, because some of this stuff, as I think you're right, is ubiquitous to the human consciousness, to our experience. We all die. We all live. We're all born. And so we really should uh, pr- approach these things open minded, but also understanding if you're going to start making claims, be very cautious in the methodology you're using because we can come up with anything. Dr. Allison, your course was fantastic. And I hope that people will go through. It was 4K. Your books also are accompanying that course. So I hope people will get them and follow along. Is there any words you'd like to say before we go? No, I just appreciate talking to you. And this is fun. These are uh, both fascinating topic. I'm sorry, not both. These are fun, fascinating, and important topics. Thank you so much. Everybody go sign up for the course. And maybe if we get enough people to come and and sign up for the course, maybe down the road, we could do a webinar Q and a with Dr. Allison. I don't know. How do you, how does that sound to you, Dr. Allison? I'm, I'm up for it. If you are, let's do it. Get the books, check out the course. Thank you, everybody.